Hello boys and girls, Irish Blackstone here with another episode of Behind the Keyboard. Today my guest is Chuck Buddha. Chuck Buddha is the author of the Gusher series, Sons of Son of Earp series, the Deck Collector series. He's also the co-host of the Mando Method with Amand Rosamilia. Enjoy. It's the the great and powerful uh, Chuck Buddha. Thank you for coming on today. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I don't I don't think I'm great. I do have some powers though. Um but maybe we won't talk about those here. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I want to know. I want to know. You, you've brought it up. Everyone wants to know, what are the great and powerful Buddha's powers? <laughs> uh, well, I know how to stink up a shoe, that's for sure. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I really don't have any powers. I, I just figured I'd be goofy. So, But, no, thanks for uh, for inviting me. Um, this is great. Yeah, our, our history goes back quite a while. Yes, it does. It seems like more and more I'm getting to interact with everyone properly like this. It's strange in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you um I, I read the the book of spite. Did I read uh the Valley of Beecho also? I can't remember, but I know I, I no. read a, a bunch of your things early on and uh and it was it was great stuff. So um that that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I um, yeah, it was the valley. It was uh, the book of spite because I wanted some blurb covers for uh, some blurb quotes. And okay, I, that's what it was. Yeah, I went to you and Amand, and Amand kind of went, "Oh, this is extreme horror." No, so. <laughs> yeah, well, as he always quotes on the show, um, you know, his his version of horror is watching beaches. So he he's not really into, which is funny because he writes it, but he doesn't watch it. And and honestly, I really don't watch too many horror programs anymore either um more from a timing standpoint than mm. you know anything else but okay so that's strange because nearly everyone else who i've who i know and i've done this with for them it's like oh yeah give me give me horror shows give me horror movies you know read other horror books and all that you and i are strange birds <laughs> Yeah, which is probably why um, I stalked him and followed him around and and really, um, I mean, if you read the restraining orders, you know, some of that stuff is in there about how I tried too much to be like him. But um, I, it's funny because I got into horror watching movies, um, you know, when I was a little kid, our, our babysitter would come over and I, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in New Jersey where I grew up. Um, even if it was summertime and your friends were still outside playing in the sun in the summer, you would have to take your bath and go to bed, you know, by dinner time. So I, I would be in my pajamas at six o'clock on a Saturday. My friends, I could hear them screaming outside the window <laughs> and uh, the babysitter would come over. My parents would go out and they would always watch, you know, creature double feature or mm -hmm. something on the local television show. And so I would, you know, of course, I was such a rebel even back then. I would creep down the hallway and and watch around the corner. So uh, so that's how I got into horror. And <laughs> as odd as that seems, <laughs> no, that's not odd at all. I mean, for, for me, my, my dad's a magician. So some of the tricks he used to do, like he would get a collar put on my mum's neck and get a sword and just jam it through. As a little kid, that's pretty horrific to experience. <laughs> I could imagine. Well, for me, my, my extent of, of magic was, you know, like my, my grandfather or somebody saying, pull my finger. And, and then, you know, some magical toot comes out of somewhere. And, and that was quite horrifying, too. But, um, yeah, I could imagine, like, the head disappeared. You're like, what? Yeah. So, you know, that and, you know, being in Australia, we've got all the, you know, creepy crawlies that want to kill you. So, you know, that's always a fun experience. How do um, you deal with that? Well, it's funny because when you're when you are in primary school, this wonderful man comes to your school with these, um, you know, plastic boxes filled with animals, you know, baby snakes, baby crocodiles and, you know, non-venomous lizards. And you get to play with them and learn how to recognize them and learn how to deal with them. Then you go to high school and the same man comes back. Now the boxes are bigger and the animals oh have more, and the animals have more teeth instead of a baby crocodile. It's now, you know, a adolescent crocodile. And the snakes are bigger snakes, and the spiders are bigger. And these ones can hurt you. And, you know, you learn how to milk a snake. And they go through all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you get to learn, oh, okay, if I see this particular spider, I know to run for the hills. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I can't even imagine. It's, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm no stranger to, um, like, creatures and stuff, you know, because I've spent 
most of my life in the woods, you mm-hmm. know, either camping or hunting or hiking or doing something. Um, but I guess it's different here because, you know, you don't encounter too many dangerous things too often. You know, every once in a while there's a black yeah. bear. But for the most part, they stay away from you un- unless you bother them with their babies. Um, there's lots of poisonous snakes, but again, um, they're mostly hidden under rocks and stuff. So unless you're you're really being invasive, you're not going to yeah. encounter them too much. But yeah, every time you read or, or watch something about Australia, it's like everything there is trying to kill you, you know, and it's everywhere. <laughs> At oh, least yeah. that's our interpretation from America. But it's actually, <laughs> I'd say 80% true. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's one of those things, Australia is one of those rare, you know, places where everything about it is built just to be hard. <laughs> you know, like summer last um, last year, you know, the summer last year, um, you know, it got days of 42, 40, 42, 43 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's like super, super hot. <laughs> you know, yeah, I can't do the conversion either. Um, that's not one of my strong suits. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll put it like this. If it's 45 degrees in the sun, it's going to be at least 50 degrees in the shade. It's that sort of heat. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, we've, you know, everything in Australia is built to burn. That's why, you know, we, you know, the bushfires that happened a couple of years ago, they're actually a regular phenomenon here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine that. That's, it's like a whole extra level of complexity to living, you know, just to survive daily. <laughs> oh, yes. But luckily, you know, we are ingenious as a people and we have air conditioning and ice cold beer. Everyone's happy. <laughs> well, that seems to work. Yeah. Beer, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, it was funny with the, um, you know, with, with COVID and the, qu- and the quarantine and lockdowns, all that here in Australia, we had, you know, a list of essential services. And one of the essential services that did not close were the booze shops. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? A man has to know his priorities. So. <laughs> I think it's more nobody wants a sober Australian. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I could say that it's probably the same on the American side. So uh, I, I think we're probably only fun when we're drinking. Well, no, I, I mean, like, I, I would not say that because a lot of the people I've spoken to are, you know, from your neck of the woods. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're mostly sober. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe I'm just referring to myself then. So <laughs> ah, so this is where you become the great Buddha. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but see, that's the thing. Um, I, I kind of doing all this. You know, my first interview was with J.C. Walsh. I've had Tim Meyer on. I've had Aman. You know, now I've got you. On. There, there seems to be you know, you, you. I think it was you who, who coined the term the Mando Mafia. <laughs> Actually, did I? Or I don't think I did. I think somebody else came up with it. But um, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously, those those are that's like my little brat pack. I, I call them my brat pack because it's, um, you know, you got the Jersey guys. So mm. it's, it's Armand. Well, and funny thing is, is, you know, I'm in Tennessee now. Armand is in Florida. Um, but, you know, Tim, Armand, um, Frank Edler and, and myself, you know, we kind of started just uh it all happened at scares the care actually one year um and i went as a fan and i wasn't selling books yet even though i was an author and of course i went to stalk armand because that's pretty much my mo for everything <laughs> i do um you know the, the guy is that great to me but um i went to stalk him and i was a fan of mr frank from his bazong podcast mm-hmm. um on Armand's network. So to meet him in person was, was great. You know, I was floored. I kept calling him Mr. Frank. He's like, you don't have to call me Mr. Frank. But I was like, I was like, but no, you're like Mr. Frank, you're Mr. Frank. You know, you're like this, this big personality for me. Um, and then of course I met Tim Meyer who I had heard on Armand's show and stuff. And I knew he was from Jersey, but, um, I'd never had the opportunity to meet him. And, and so when I met him, um, you know, he's so laid back and down to earth and, and, how can you not like him? Um, so the four of us kind of built this bond, I guess, out of scares that care around the fact that we were all New Jersey horror mm-hmm. authors and stuff. And uh, and then J.C. Walsh became part of the picture, too, because um, he came to one of our book signings at a, at a microbrewery. And it was funny because, you know, he, he's he's a very intimidating looking guy. You know, he's got the shaved head and he's got these huge muscles and and um 
at the time he was he was like squinting to to like look at us as we were setting up for the book signing but i interpreted it that he he wanted to kick my ass so because <laughs> like you know his his brows were furrowed and he was like staring at me and stuff and I, I I went over to Armand and Frank. I was like I was like, hey, you guys got my back. I think I think we're gonna go down here. You know, this guy I think he wants to fight me and stuff. Um, and, and I, I'm no stranger to being beaten up, you know, by guys in bars. And, and that's a story for another time. But um, so I was like, all right, you know, I, I guess we're gonna fight tonight. And and it turns out that it was JC who had been you know corresponding with us online from listening to the podcast, but we had never seen him. Um, so it was funny. And then once we got to know him and, and he moved to Philadelphia, so he was really close to us. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we started writing together and hanging out and stuff. And so uh, it may have been JC that came up with the Mondo Mafia. You know, I, I don't know. That's a good one. We're going to have to research that one. I'm so, I'm, I feel bad. I don't have an answer for that one. But um, I don't think it was me, though. Oh, well, take credit. Always take credit. <laughs> I, I will for now while we're yeah. on the show. Until somebody calls me out on Twitter and they're like, you idiot, you were, you know. <laughs> oh, no. It, 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 it's funny because, um, you know, I've been listening to the, to, you know, the Mondo Method for a long time. And, you know, I, I hadn't seen any photos of you or a mod. So when I finally saw a photo of both of you, I was just kind of, I kind of went, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Nobody ever looks like what they sound like, right? I mean, it, it's 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 funny because I grew up, you know, listening to the podcast with Armand and Mr. Frank and all these other folks, and and you have this vision in your head of what people look like. Um, and, and I guess you know people had pictures on Amazon and stuff, but but not always, or or it was like a, a cartoonish picture or yeah. something or an old photo. Um, and then when you meet people in person or you finally see them, you know, online, you're like, oh, my God, you know, it's nothing like what I thought. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, like you see a man, you know, he's got the shaved head. He's got the big beard. He, you know, he looks like a, a biker who can, you know, he can fuck shit up. And when the vo when you hear the voice, he kind of, you know, like when I was doing the interview, actually, no, last year for NaNoWriMo and I joined in on the um, live stream, you know, part of me in the back of the head is like, don't make a comment about how Amand and Chuck look compared to the voices. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that would have been fine. Um, actually, the, the thing to talk about would have been, you know, to torture me on the NaNoWriMo because, uh, you know, that that's, uh, oh, I, I really don't like it anymore. I used to love it, but now it, it's it, it's become, you know, like that's that piece of wood under my my skin or under my fingernail. But um, but I am going to try. I know I said recently on the Mondo Method that I was not going to, be involved this year but um i'm kind of excited about a few things that i'm working on so i'm like you know what i, I should use it to keep my momentum and 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 join in with everybody i do like the you know the the, the group motivation mm. the camaraderie that you have with people from all over the place you know through the NaNoWriMo but but i can't help you know i'm not an athlete anymore now i'm a chubby guy but there was a time when i was an athlete so i can't help but be competitive you know uh -huh. and, and you want to beat the other guy with his numbers yeah uh john quick <laughs> and um you know and try and keep up with them and you know and, and that's where you get yourself into trouble because you're really only competing with yourself it's really about slaying the inner demon you yep. know uh of your own um consistency and and discipline and work ethic it's not really about beating the other people but we're typical guys and we're from jersey so everything's about one upping you know <laughs> no I, I i get that and i mean i've i've done nanorimo i think i've done it like twice now and last year that last year was the only year of you know second time i've done it and i won it and i scrapped everything i wrote <laughs> really oh my god yeah, i can't even yeah. imagine so what happened well what, you didn't like so, it or well because this was a book I owed Sevid Press, and so I decided to use NaNoWriMo to write it. I, I'd been in a massive writing slump, so I thought, okay, I'll use NaNoWriMo and all this, and it was going great. You know, it was going to be about 60,000, 60, 70,000 words. I hit that 50,000 mark. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, fuck yeah. And I'm still I'm going, and then all of a sudden this voice in the back of my head just went, you know, this is shit. Deep down, you know this is a shit book you're writing. It should You should start again. And I kind of went, hmm and I, I checked my outline i was going over the outline i went 
oh son of a bitch yeah it is shit it's too complicated for what it was it, it just was all over the place trying to be something it wasn't I went, okay pare it back down did forty two thousand words and that was the value of beach <laughs> oh okay well see but at least you you didn't scrap it all together so it, it still ended up being something and and obviously it worked for you in terms of getting you out of that slump i mean oh, yeah. i'm the king i'm the king of writing slumps so you know i'll do anything you know if it helps get me out of the malaise that I, you know I, I mean i've had a terrible year and a half you know and i've tried to point fingers at covid and everything else and um you know but i'm no fool it it, it all comes down to you know myself and just getting the, the stuff done and but i'm back on track so yeah if and i'm hoping to do the same with nanowrimo this year as much as i loathe it, <laughs> it it will be you know the the help and the impetus that i need to continue my momentum now that i'm back on track so oh, that's good though that's the good thing about nanowrimo and i mean i, I will admit that I, I love it when we get close to, to nanowrimo because Aman starts going at you about it oh. big time on the show. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just what you guys hear on the show. I mean, behind the scenes, like the text messages and everything else, it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm on the bottom of the pile when, when you know, in our group, I, I'm the guy that everyone makes fun of and kicks. No, we all are. But, um, <laughs> but you know, that that's what, that's my thing. So, like, everybody's got their thing that we mm. pick on each other. And, and for me, you know, it's, uh, well, I have a bunch of things, actually. I'm very easy that way because I am so obnoxious. But <laughs> but one of them is is the NaNoWriMo. So, so yeah, I get shit from, from everybody all over the place. And, and, and the, the person who's nicest to me about NaNoWriMo is John Quick. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he's the guy that whips my ass every year. And really, he could really be a jerk and flaunt it and, and hold it over me, and he doesn't. He's actually a classy guy, and uh, he's a great writer, but um, but I, I will give him props for that, that he he's he's a classy winner. So, Well, I've, I've not really interacted with him. I've read some of his stuff. I, I get that, and, you know, when I've heard him interviewed and all that, and it could also, and I totally get that he's a classy guy. It could also be because he knows you're not a threat. Well, you know, you may have uncovered <laughs> something there. <laughs> That's a great insight, and and I'm kind of upset that you you came to that, but uh, you're probably right there. That's probably more the truth than anything. So, uh. <laughs> oh no, I'm an Australian. We, we talk shit all the time, so you know, feel free to ignore no, no. half of it. <laughs> no, I'm easygoing, and you know what? I agree 100 percent with you. That's probably the reason. So. <laughs> could be worse though it, it definitely could be worse <laughs> yeah I, I, you know what um i'm i'm lucky to to be a part of this community and and know people like you and john and armand and frank and everybody i mean it, it's uh you know you see a lot of stuff on twitter and people are melting down and going at it and it's just whatever i i mean the world is the way it is and yeah. stuff but um but i still have such a great group of you know, friends, whether they're online friends or I've seen them in person. Um, I, I'm really lucky to to have people that help support. And like, you you know, you listening to the show, it still blows my mind that that people listen to us, um, not to Armand, because he's he's got a, a wealth of experience and knowledge um, because he's been around for so long and he's he's tried just about everything. And he knows everybody in the industry, but um, you know, for me, I'm truly humbled when when people come up to us at like Scares of Care or some other convention and they're like, "Oh, you know, I listen to the show and and thank you for all." That. And I'm like, "Thank me, thank you." I mean, you know, I did this selfishly, really, because Armand pulled me aside after he smacked me around um, <laughs> at Scares of Care for my imposter syndrome because i was like oh you know i'm like look at all these authors and writers like i don't belong here and stuff and he basically you know stuck his fingers up my nostrils <laughs> pulled me out to the vestibule and uh and and was like poking me in the chest and he dropped the f-bomb about 30 times and he's like you belong here just the same as everybody else your writing is good and you know we all have this and shut up and he's like you know what i'll give you a chance to make up for it he's like do a podcast with me and and um you know, let's just talk about everything that 
you go through with writing and I'll try and help you and, and we'll let people listen in. And I was like, all right. And I was like, hey, it gives me a chance to one, learn from him and mm-hmm. two, spend all the time with him, you know, because the restraining order does not cover uh, <laughs> Skype. So so that was a win win for me. Um, but yeah, it's just you're just amazed all the time that people um, listen to us and, and interact and, and going back to the Mondo Mafia. I mean, we've got a great group of people that uh, send us questions and tweet at us and all kinds of stuff. And it's uh, it's really cool and it's special and, and it's something that I never even dreamed about, like when it started. So um, so it, it's pretty cool. I, I don't I don't doubt it. I mean, it, it's weird because I, 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 I have imposter syndrome. I think we all do. And for me, doing this, doing the show for me, it's been a case of, you know, I get, you know, OK, I know JC. We've we've hung out before, you know, digitally and all that. So mm-hmm. having him be the first um, person on the show, that was just, you know, all right, we'll have, you know, shits and giggles. And then, you know, getting people like Lee Murray, V Castro, Armand, Jake Bible. And it's just one of those things where it's kind of like, oh, oh, hell. I, I'm, yeah, I'm I know your, li- your list of guests is like a who's who. I'm, I'm like, man, like, where do you even like get them to interact with you? I wouldn't even know where to start to be like, hey, do you want to do this show or something? Like, uh, that's incredible. I, I think that's that's awesome. Like how, how you're able to to really get um a wide range of, of authors. I mean, it's awesome. It's funny. I, I, a lot of it, I owe Lee Murray. <laughs> this is the funny thing. Like, cause I interviewed her and we had some interactions before and I interviewed her and we finished the interview and she says, you know, she goes, okay, who else do you want to have on? And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, you've got a list. What authors do you want to have on? I was like, um, okay. And I just ran down the list and she went, okay, I've got their emails. I'll send them to you. You use my name. <laughs> Wow. See, that that's how great this this community is, you know, like the true day to day uh, horror author and writer. Everybody's really good. Now, if we can yep. just all keep our depression and, and our opinions to ourselves, I, I think it'll be great. We'll be back on track again. Oh, definitely. And, and, and I have to admit, that's something I love about the Mondo Method is you guys, you know, you, you, you don't really focus on it the shitstorms that constantly seem to be happening in the community. You know, you, you know, you know, okay. So Chuck, what are, you, what are we talking about today? And off you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple things. One is we're just, it's, it's just so annoying. And if, and if you want to be a part of that, you know, and some people like it or whatever, um, you know, it's all out there. So mm. there's no need to talk about it. You can just read and, and follow and get involved uh, as much as you want. Um, and, and, you know, we both kind of don't like that stuff. So uh, we just stick to who we are for for good or bad. Um, but the other thing is, is uh, it's just too much fun to talk about all the stuff we screw up, you know? So it's like we don't have time to do like current events and everything because I am screwing shit up on a daily <laughs> basis. And um, and we found that, you know, our ratings are highest when I'm doing something stupid and Armand is yelling at me. So, so kind of our MO has just been to, you know, he'll tell me, he'll be like, all right, Chuck, we just screw up this week. And I'll be like, Oh, like the list is long. Here's like 50 of them. Which one do you want to cover? He's like, Oh, this one, I'll rip you a new ass on this one, you know? And then, and then we have a call and, uh, and it's great. And it's lots of fun. And, and that's one of the things I think that we like about, you know, because like all writers, we listen to multiple writing podcasts, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you know, we listened to Brian Keene's when he had it. We listened to yours. We listened to the sample chapter podcast, you know, all the podcasts that are out there um, because there's so many different point of views. There's so many authors that get interviewed and you're, you're always trying to absorb and learn and listen and, and and find that one nugget, you know, that might help you with your own writing and career. Um, but the thing I think that that always bothered um, Armand and I is and not so much like the interview shows, but the, the shows where where the podcast hosts kind of talk at the listener. Um, it, it always came off that, you know, they know the way to be successful and this is what you do. And, you know, we're selling all these books and stuff. And, and it's funny, I still don't know how to do, you know, looking at the Amazon ranking and all that, but Armand does. And, and he would look them up and he'd be like, 
these people are full of shit. He's like, you know, they're not selling any books. He's like, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's a lie and it's a fabrication. And, um, and they would always talk about just all the great stuff, like, oh, I'm marketing. And I just sold like, you know, a hundred thousand copies in my hardcover book that I got this deal and all this stuff. And, uh, and it's great. It pumps you up and you feel excited. And, you know, as, as a writer, you use that to fuel yourself, but, but at some point, you know, you just you want to know like really what's going on and and so for us it was uh you know it wasn't to paint a bad picture of writing and publishing but it was more to be realistic and it's like hey when we do something great let's pat ourselves on the back but when we yeah. screw up we're not going to hide and be like oh i'm selling tons of books we're going to say oh yeah this was a complete bust and you know this is why i think it happened and we still don't have the answers for stuff um and and that's kind of the fun of it is just trying to figure it out and discover it and, and get people to tell us like, Oh no, you're a moron. This is why you, you did this wrong. And, you know, um, it's just fun. It, we have a lot of fun and it's, uh, we hope someday, well, I hope someday Armand is successful, but I hope someday to be able to say, you know, I finally did it. Like, you know, I'm selling tons of books now and making all kinds of money, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm positive. It's going to happen. And, and I can say this because when I interviewed Lee, I said that she was probably going to win the Bram Stoker this year, and she did. So I'm I, I'm pretty positive that you're going to become successful. All right, yeah, yeah. Give, give me that mojo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, that's the that, that's the thing. I mean, the episodes where you you know, you screw up and Aman rips you a new one. Those are great episodes. But there are the, my favorite episodes are the ones where you're trying something new, like you're trying a new outlining method, or you're doing a um, you know you're going wide or you're not go or you decide okay i'm going to do a patreon or you, it's like okay and then you know those big grand proclamations from you of i'm going wide a couple weeks later <laughs> it fucked up <laughs> which is funny so that's one of the so going wide i mean that's a great point so that was one of the things that i mean i did several times throughout the last five years and and it, it went belly up every time and then this last time you know, I, I just always had this thing in the back of my mind. I was like, it, it's got to be able to work. Like I, I and I honestly, I still don't know why it's working. Um, but right now I, I'm selling as much and sometimes more wide than I am on Amazon. And, you know, I, my theory and this is just me mm. and take it for what it's worth, because I believe in Bigfoot and UFOs and all that stuff. But um, my theory is just that. Uh, I guess I've been around enough for five years and I'm not famous or well-known or anything, but I think I've been around enough in five years that people may have heard of me or seen something um, and they're not an Amazon Kindle reader. And so, you know, it just finally got to the point that putting that stuff out there on Kobo, on the Nook and stuff, and then somebody, and I do no advertising or, you know, no social media posts saying, Hey, I'm wide, you know, again, which you can hear on the podcast, Armand yells at me all the yep. time. Cause I just, I, I go down too many rabbit holes on social media. So that's why I don't, I don't use it. But, um, I think people just, they, they were just like, Oh, he's finally here. So now, you know, maybe I'll give his, his books a try or something. Um, I don't know. It's bizarre and, and it's working and I'm not really doing anything for it. Um, so I'm hoping it stays that way, but um, but what's the difference between this time and the first five times I did it? Nothing. <laughs> so mm, pandemic. <laughs> you think like people are just reading more because they're locked away in their home and well, I'll, I'll put it like this. I am, um, you know, I'm living in Australia and I recently moved back here from Mexico. And when I, right. you know, I had to do two weeks hotel quarantine you know, and a lot of people and a lot of authors I know have gone, oh, two weeks in a hotel room. You could get so much stuff done, you know, so much writing. Yeah, that's two weeks in a hotel room if you choose it. Now, I walked into that hotel room. They closed the door. You do not leave until your time is up. You don't see anyone. So, you know. Wow. And that was the sort of thing. Okay, I, you know, I had books I needed to catch up on. I read all these books. I had, um, you know, okay, I didn't do the Netflix and all that sort of stuff too much because that would have just, you know, killed me. I was catching up on Mondo Method episodes I had, you know, I hadn't listened to yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, like, the one about the um, 
there was the one where um you t- you talked about you know how to write a fight scene <laughs> okay yeah I, a couple of points in that i disagree with but um not not yeah, from yeah, you guys but from, not from you guys but from the actual article that, that you okay. guys were talking about <laughs> um it was that sort of thing where i and i had that thing of oh well yeah everyone's binging stuff at the moment everyone needs entertainment and that's what you know like I, you know, there are authors who write these big, emotional, heavy-hitting things that are a gut punch when you read it, and you admire the skill. That's great, but more and more, I've noticed people are going for just dumb entertainment. Right. And and I I don't want to say what you write is dumb, but I mean. No, no, no. Yeah, know. I know what you're saying. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I you, it's escapism. You know, exactly. They're looking for, and you know what? You may, you, you're reminding me of something is. Um, the books that are selling more for me wide are the box sets. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you may be touching on something that, um, you know, it's difficult because I write in series. I, I just, that's the way my brain works. It's very difficult for me to think of a standalone. Not that I can't, you know, I have one coming out later this year, but, um, but my, my mind works in serials because I grew up watching serial TV shows. Yeah. Um, and and I get it, you know, uh, I hear it from my wife, who's a big fan of Robert Jordan. Like she she doesn't read horror. She reads fantasy, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and historical fiction and stuff. But um, she loved, you know, I think it's the Wheels of Time series from Robert Jordan or whatever. And the poor guy, you know, died before it finished or whatever. And and, you know, so and I remember her saying stuff like that, like she loves series and she falls in love with the characters and, you know, the, the length of time that from book one to whatever. And, um, and so I think it's difficult for people to, to get into a series. So maybe that's the problem with authors like me who write pretty solely in a serial format is that, Hey, I don't want to read that until it's done, (laughs) you know, because I don't want to get emotionally invested through book one through five. And then, you know, Chuck shits the bed and and that's Mr. Frank's favorite term that I use, (laughs) you know, Chuck, Chuck shits the bed and dies. And now I never know what happens to the characters. And so those stories, you know, the books that I've put on wide are completed series. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's the box sets that are really selling uh, more than the individual books. So, so you may be right. You know, it, it's like, Hey, people are looking for the escapism. Oh, and by the way, this is a complete series. So now I'll do it, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, you look at, you know, like, all the streaming services are, you know, they're making all the money, you know. Then you've got box sets of books, you know, you've got Kindle Vela, which is just pure serial. That's, you know, taking off. Mm-hmm. We're in the age of binging. Yeah. You know, I, I write standalone. That's the thing. I, 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 I've, I all, the, all the books I've put out have kind of like had the setup to be a series. And you know, writing for Soviet Press, unfortunately, the books haven't made enough for them to say, yes, continue the series. But, <laughs> yeah. Well, but the, but the standalones, see, now the grass is always greener because I look at people like you who write the standalones and Tim Meyer and stuff, and I'm like, God, I wish I could do that because nothing is more frustrating than when I go to a convention or I do a book signing at like Beers and Fears or something. Um, I don't have standalones. So nobody... I shouldn't say nobody, but it's harder to, for me to sell uh, trying me out mm. by reading just book one or something, even though the books stand on their own. Um, it's more, you know, it's an investment. Somebody has to go, well, if I buy book one and I like it, then I kind of got to read the rest. You know, whereas if you're Tim Meyer or somebody, somebody could walk up and and see, you know, eight or ten great standalone novels and be like, oh, I want this one, this one, this one read it be satisfied and and they're on to whatever other author you know so mm. um it's difficult to be able to sell i think in person without standalones at least that i've found so i wish i could be like you and, and be able to accomplish a standalone i'm going to try my first time this year we'll see if it works i don't know <laughs> oh well, i'm looking forward to hearing how that episode goes <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. see you, you you say you you know like I, I, you know for me i Okay, the Valley of Beecho, that's a, you know, standalone story, but it could I've got that set up in my head. That could be a series of more standalone stories with the same characters. It's okay. it, it would 
it'd be a series, but it's just standalone adventures. To me, that's how. To me, that would be that's the perfect series because it doesn't matter what, which one you pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I like I write I like writing standalone books. I would love to have a series get picked up. It's just that sort of thing. As I said, I'm not making enough money <laughs> to be for for Seven Press for them to say continue the series, which. You know, you say, "Oh, it's great that you're writing standalones," and there's, and I'm, well, yeah, but that's because I'm not making enough money. <laughs> well, the grass, the grass is greener because you know yeah. I write series and I'm not making enough money either. So you know, um, it goes each way. But I mean, off the top of my head, the three big series that Seven put out: there's Willie Meekle's S Squad, which is Scottish Special Forces going up against creature features. Yep, I have all of those books. <laughs> yep. Oh, how good are they? Well, I haven't read them yet, so. Here's another conundrum that I have. I have everybody's <laughs> book. Ask me how many of them I've read. Mm. You know, a small handful. I've probably yeah. got like 3,000 books on my Kindle. Um, and all of them look great when I go to dive in. But then I'm just like, I, I can't read them all. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the covers and the synopsis of those Willie Meekle books, you know, how can you not want them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, actually, Value Beach is kind of in- inspired by those. So yeah. Um, yeah, you, know, you got those. You've got the Jake Bible, um, Rourke. oh, the Mac. Yeah. yeah, 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 Dead Mac. You got Rogue, Galactic Bounty Hunter. You know, he's like those two are the guys who are kind of yeah, you know, they'll do maybe trilogy of a trilogy, um, with other authors, but it's nothing as big because you know, Esquad is up to book twelve. You know, when I mean, that bastard's already started working on book thirteen. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean his his stuff is good. He he does like everything. I mean yeah. You know, he's got like um, I don't. They're not like knockoffs, but like almost like the Sherlock Holmes stuff and all that. So like, you know, he's he's really interesting. Um, well, he, I would love to. I would love to hear him on, on more podcasts and stuff. You know, because he's he's such a I, like I look at him and I'm like with the experience and just his his ability to conquer so many different you know flavors of of the genre. Um, he he would be a, a really great one to to listen to. Well, see, he was one that he, you know, I I had him on the show a while back, and mm-hmm. that was because of you know Lee. She you know because she said to me the worst thing anyone can do is say no. All right, so he sent me man. He said, yeah, I'm in. I'm like, oh oh shit. Yeah. And people said yes. Oh shit. Okay. Well, <laughs> and, you know the interview was great. We we you know we talked books and then we just geeked out over Ray Harryhausen and Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? But he needs to be. I think it's almost like a disservice that he's not out there more. Um, and, and I don't know if that's, if that's like his choice or, or just, you know, the people, because there there are a lot, like there are certain shows that only go after like the big fish, Yeah, you know, and then you listen to them and, and the big, not that there's anything wrong with that because, you know, I still get excited listening to, top-notch authors you know talk about their their the process and the story and all that kind of stuff too um but it's almost like they're on that that like talk show Uh cycle you know like letterman or well see that's showing my age like jimmy fallon or something um because every time they have a new book they're on the podcast and it's like okay you know these guys are great but but i want to hear other voices and, and and different people and uh um, you see the same thing too. A lot of times with um, with like the book bloggers, um, it, a lot of times it's like the same people over and over again. Mm-hmm. And yep. um, part of that is just my my naivety in that I didn't know that. I guess you have to send the, the book bloggers your book and say, yep. you know, will you review this? I just thought that they were like, you know, picking stuff up that they were interested in and and reading it or following things on Twitter or whatever else. But um, somebody straightened me out pretty recently. And they're like, no, you got to like send them the book and, and ask them to review. I was like, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> but again, like, how do I do that? Because I've got series. So I'm not going to send somebody book one and be like, you know, and and piss them off because it's I'm like teasing them or whatever. Um, and I, I don't have that standalone thing to, to provide them. Mm. Well, well, I remember, I think it was 2019, 
yeah, pretty sure it was 2019, on Instagram, you put out a thing about, um, you know, you had um, audio codes to give away to, um, for the audiobook version of Slashing Away in the first cut. Right. You know, I, you know, I, I, I yep, you know, I did it just because, ooh, I get to, you know, because I've been listening to the Mando method, so I'm like, I'm going to, I get, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, experience your writing. And I've, I've listened to both of those. <laughs> You're the one. Yeah, I'm the one. I'm the one. You know that poor lady who had to read those sex scenes and stuff. Like I, I always felt bad for her because you know she's a really nice person, and uh, you know I I went through the process with Find Away Voices of of picking her, and and of course that was the series that I decided to try something different Mm. and use Find Away Voices instead of um, ACX and Audible, and. and, and, you know, I asked her, I was like, well, you know, it, it she, and she, I forgot what kind of books she usually does, did, or does do, do. Yeah, I'm a writer. I can't even do verb tenses, does. but she, uh, <laughs> she did more like, uh, like, I think romances mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. I think there was some erotica maybe in there, but, you know, but from my headspace, I'm like, okay, but I'm like a dirty old man. And I'm, I have like this extreme, you know, splatter punk horror with over the top sex and listening, you know, when I would listen to her, um, her recordings to, to approve it. And, and she has to say the words and stuff. And I'm just like, I felt so bad for her. I'm like, Oh, that poor lady. I mean, at least she was earning her money, but, um, (laughs) but it's like, you know, the, the stuff that people have to read, you know, she has to, she doesn't choose to, you know, it was like, I hired you. Now you have to read this, and she's probably like, "Oh my god, I should not have said yes to this." But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it, though. That's that's awesome. I did, I did, and see, I'm terrible because I read these books and I go, "I've got to, I've got to send a message to the author saying how much I enjoyed it," and I always forget to do it. <laughs> so, well, you know, so, it's it's hard. I mean, there, there's, yeah. you know, like with everything else, there's so much to do and so little time, and. Um, you know, Armand yells at me all the time. I mean, now, since I've been an author for the last five years, whenever I read something, I, I leave a review, you know, so I do, I do a written review on Amazon. Um, I do the starred review, I guess, on Goodreads, because, mm-hmm. because when, when you finish a book on Kindle, it doesn't let you write a review on Kindle. Yeah. And let's face it, who the hell wants to, you know, with the little keyboard and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's just a mess. Um, so I just do the starred rating on the Kindle for Goodreads. I go to Amazon and type up an actual review. And then on BookBub now, um, I click on all the categories that they give you. I star it. You know, I, I do like five stars or whatever. And then I do all the categories like great characters, awesome world building, whatever. But I don't actually write a review. And Armand yells at me all the time. He's like, you owe those. You should, you know, put a review everywhere. And I'm, I'm just like. Yeah, but to go and copy and paste it from Amazon, and then I got to <laughs> sign into Goodreads because Goodreads it's not on my computer; it's on the Kindle. Uh, so then I got to, you know, which is really, you know, it's crappy that 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 it works that way because Amazon owns or something Goodreads, you know, or is in bed with them. And why not? If 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 the parent companies are involved, why aren't the reviews on Amazon transferring to Goodreads or vice versa? It should happen automatically. Like you shouldn't have to go from one place to the other. I mean, if it just makes sense from an ease and and sustainability, but also just if they want to sell more books, how do you sell more books? The same way authors do credibility. You know, the more ratings and reviews you have, the more they'll sell. And yeah. obviously they make more money from us. So why wouldn't they put that in into place? I know Armand is always like, well, you got to remember books is like not their high priority. You know, that's. You know that they have other things that they make money on, like ads and everything else. And yeah, I get it, but you know, uh, but see, my counter argument to that, to you know, like a man saying books are not the priority. Okay, fair point. But the counter argument is this: at the moment, okay, people binge everything, so they're binging books. You know, eventually Amazon would would will go. Hey, on, look at all these new authors. All these people are making money. Hmm. And by that point, they're going to be screwed because of godless horror. <laughs> yeah, godless is awesome. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, man, the stuff that that you see on godless. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like talk about extreme. Like if you like extreme, 
Godless is your place. Don't don't go anywhere else. Go to Godless yep. because, I mean, the the, the stories, the authors, um, and and you know, Drew has mainstream type stuff on there too, um, which is cool. But yeah, I mean, great support, great product that he puts out. I mean, it's very easy to buy things yep. and download them, and you know, and, and scour through the list of bestsellers or new releases and stuff. I mean, it, it's. It's a it's it's a great thing. I'm so glad that, you know, he put some of my stuff up there and um, yeah, yeah, just having a lot of fun with it. Well, that's it. I mean, I, I, I was a little late to Godless. Like, you know, all these other authors I know were like, oh, yeah, you know, talking about Godless. I was like, OK. So I sent him and sent Drew an email saying, um, you know, just introducing myself, saying, hey, I've got these books. And the reply came. Yes, I know who you are. I'd like to work with you. And I just sat there. Went, <laughs> he said the same thing to me. And I was like. <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, if you know who I am, then then you're probably in the dark shadow somewhere because, you know, um, no, but yeah, he's great. And and he knows he knows who everybody is. I mean, the guy is like really, you know, tuned in and, and so supportive because yeah. any questions you have, um, you know, he's all over it. And, and he's he's a one man show. I mean, he's doing all that plus his own writing. You know, I, I mean. I don't know how he does it. He must be like high on cocaine all the time because he's uh, the guy's got like massive amounts of energy and uh, never takes a break. Yeah, that's I mean, yeah. And, you know, we've got the Godless app out now, too. And I mean, we could end up becoming shields for them. And some people might think that with the episode, but I kind of I don't care. Every, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at everything that he's done, and he's doing with Godless. I just sit there and go, I'm exhausted just thinking about how much effort he's putting in. And then I kind of go, oh, man, maybe I should be putting the same amount of effort into my work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have that revelation every day because, um, you know, it, it's, again, because of the people that I surround myself with and, and I see what they're doing. And, and I'm just like, man, it's a, it's a it's a crime that I'm not doing more, you know, to 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 work harder, you know, and I think I work hard. But from the author standpoint, um there's so much harder, you know, there's so much more that I have to do. Um, But Godless is, it's great because, you know, like you said, that there's so much stuff that's coming out there and, and it's very, it's very fresh. um, A lot of risk taking and uh, interesting stuff. I mean, some of it is like over the top and, you know, you really got to have a stomach for it and stuff, but, um, but it's, it's just, it's great and and the fact that that it's all there and and the community who's into godless is is like ravenous but also the fact that you know that drew gives money to charity and and he also allows the author to keep you know a lion's share of yeah. of the royalties it's um I, I mean it's great so not only are my books on there i've i've you know i've part purchased shirts and hats and you know, I'm I'm all in onto the godless, like you said too. It's uh, it, it's good, and and we plan to have fun too. So, uh, you know, we want to like write more, um, stories and kind of build like godless worlds almost. You know, yeah, and, and and put stuff out there, and it's uh, it's just fun from a creative standpoint to try something different. You know, um, because while some of my stuff is extreme, it's not even close to some of the authors that are on there who are really yeah. good at it. And so, like, I'm always trying to like keep up with them, and it's 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 cool. But well, that that that's the, that was something I actually, you know, funny enough, I did actually have I do have questions I wanted to ask. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I no, tend to talk no, a lot, so no, um, no, hit the mute like, button on me. <laughs> no, no, honestly, I'm this is this is all for you. I mean, I'm enjoying this because I'm uh, you know because I am a fan of I am a fan. I'm just sitting here happy just. Getting to talk oh, to I want to I want to interview you. First of all, you're luscious looking. I mean, and that beard. You know, I, I mean, I've kind of stalked you from your pictures online, but now looking at you in person on the screen, uh, Armand's going to have some competition. You know, and, and but I, yep. I would love to know about you know the whole Mexico thing, and and you still have to <laughs> yell at me for my sad uh, attempt was, in an Australian accent. So. I was I was getting to that, sir. I was okay. getting to that. <laughs> Okay, so the Mexico thing was I, I went there in 20... Like, this is the short version of the story. Okay. I went to Mexico... Okay, first things first. The beard. I've, I've had the beard for about 
10 years or so it, it, at various lengths. And I've always preferred having the big beard, you know, I kind of want to get to like the Aman, Aman um, level of beardness. And luckily at the moment here um, where I live, the um, with the lockdowns we're in, you can get a haircut, but they're not allowed to touch the beard. So I'm like, really? Yeah, it's that thing of, okay, you know, maybe transferring, you know, all that sort of stuff. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't care. I don't care because, you know, like, yes. You know, it's right, growing. Yeah. Get away so, from me with those clippers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, so, yeah, that that's the beard. And I, I, I don't do anything. It just grows naturally. It's just pure. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. And, thank you. Um, Mexico was, I, I went there in 2014 um, on a potential job because my, my writing career, basically, it was 15 years of doing movie scripts. Yeah. And I went there. Um, I was hired basically to write a movie, and I went there to do all the research. There's going to be like kind of like a, a very very modern update on Man on Fire. Okay. Yeah, and I was there for about two and a half months, and I didn't know anything about Mexico. I never, you know, I knew nothing about it except what I saw on movies and TV shows. You right. know, so being in Mexico City was a big surprise, and I didn't speak Spanish, so you know, there for two and a half months. Um, they they found a, a very nice lady to um, be my tour guide and my translator, and we fell in love. Um, and, you know, it was kind of hard coming back to Australia. And, um, I you know, she came out and visited, and I realized, yeah, I was going to marry her. So I moved to Mexico in 2016. Okay. And because i did that got married in 2017 it was that case of well okay i'm never going to be able to make movies that was my goal i wanted to you know make movies i couldn't do that in mexico because of the the language barrier okay and you know i had all these unwritten unproduced scripts and people i knew were saying write them as a book and self-publish and around the same and i was thinking oh yeah i could do that and around the same time i was listening to the mando method i was listening to jake bible's writing in suburbia i was listening yeah. to um what was it the dead robot society podcast mm -hmm. and you know bible jake bible and paul e cooley were talking about severed press and i had that in the back of my head so i wrote this book which was just just a blatant rip of james bond with a female spy it was um a female james bond with um the, th the third man storyline set in cuba basically <laughs> okay and i wrote it sent it to some other publishers and they all said no you know they didn't you know they said it's not it's not good enough <laughs> basically okay. so i was like okay why i reread it and i realized okay it's missing that it's missing something now in Mexico City, the population is about 23 million people. Now, to put that into context, that's the same population as all of Australia. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in one city, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, which I lived there for about five years. And, yeah, I come from a small country town here in Australia. So it's that sort of thing of every now and then I was just like, I can't handle it. So they have this great subway system. And certain times of the day peak hour traffic you know the laws of physics get forgotten as people try to shove into the cars <laughs> mm -hmm. and when you come out you know you've got to do i call it the zombie shuffle up the stairs up the escalators you know and i'm in, i'm in this day, this one day and i just looked around and went that's what's missing from this book zombies <laughs> for some reason <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, that goes no, with everything, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, and I kind of, and it was that sort of thing of, okay, I, I don't know. I only know of one zombie story set in Cuba, which was a movie called One of the Dead. I don't know any, you know, I kind of always thought, well, yeah, James Bond, that sort of super spy should go up against terrible monsters. So why not? <laughs> you know? And I rewrote it, added all the zombies, and I kind of went, okay, I'm going to send it to Seven Press. And if they said no, I was going to self publish it. And I sent it. And they said yes. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm literally a nobody, never published anything. And they've said yes to me. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so arrogant. Now, this is 2017. End of 2017, <laughs> they said yes. I was so arrogant. I said on the cover, because I had in my head that this was going to be a big success. And I was going to, you know, I had the idea of doing a trilogy. So this was going to be a big success. So I said on the cover, it's going to say book one, the apocalypse trilogy. And they said, okay. 
they release the Borg and it shits and dies. <laughs> it sells. Aww. It sells nothing. But from the moment they said, yes, I started writing the sequel. So I wrote the sequel and I, you know, the book comes out and I sent it to them. Um, I sent them to them like two days after the book came out. <laughs> That's how arrogant and naive I was. I said, here's the sequel. And they went, um, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Let's um, hold off on that and wait <laughs> until it's sold something. I was like, awesome. The first royalty statement, you know, I was like, oh, first royalty is the first payment for books. And it was like, like you know, 10 bucks. I was like, hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, it's still early in the process, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it came out um, like January of 2019. No, 2018. January 28, 2018. Um, so, you know, I was in that first royalty payment, you know, first quarter thing. And I was like, okay, hmm. Okay, I started working on other stories. I was like, okay. And the next royalty came in and it was less. I was like, oh, they're not going to do this. They're not going to go with the sequel. And then I, I was like, oh, man, man, I'm an idiot. Why did I put book one? But why did I say book one? I should have just left it as, oh, you dick. It was that <laughs> sort of thing. And while living in Mexico, I was teaching English to businessmen. So, you know, every day I'm going out and about and I'd have to wait for classes to begin or I'd wait for my students to show up. So I was writing all the time. And, you know, it was one of those things like, hey, I was just writing the stories I wanted that I, I wanted, you know, just dumb stuff, you know. Like, I had the idea of doing, you know, Jurassic Park, but instead of it being dinosaurs, it's Godzilla. <laughs> but Which, see, that, that's what we all do, is we write what we want to read, you yeah. know? At, at, at least most of us. I, I don't want to chase the the, the, market, the local yeah. fads or, you know, because I'm not excited about that stuff, you know? Or I may be now, but not down the road. So for me, I just, yeah, I want to write what I want to write. Well, which is it. why I don't sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't worry. I'm the same. So you know, I apply for not selling things. <laughs> same, true to ourselves. <laughs> but that, That's right. That... I've got my pride. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll keep me warm at night. <laughs> um, but it's that sort of thing of, you know, listening to the Mondo method really did help me kind of realize. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have to take arrogance out and just okay. I'm going to write stories that I want to. I want to write. I want to read. I'll send them the seven. If they say yes, great. If they say no, I'll self-publish. And, you know, Severed have said yes to everything I've sent them at the moment. So I'm kind of like, either they're really desperate or I'm doing something right with that market. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're doing the right stuff. Yeah, it's funny, uh, you know, how you mention the arrogance and stuff. Why? We're like our own worst enemies, right? Oh, yes. Because we're always in our own heads. So you're, you're either, you know, like I, I'm the... The, the champion of WWE coming down the ramp with my music playing, or I'm totally cowering in the corner in imposter syndrome and I'm texting Armand and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. I suck. I'm no good at this. And then he's like, shut up and stop texting me this stuff. You know? So w w it's those highs and the lows. We're either like so afraid of our stuff or we think it stinks or we're walking around all puffy chest and like, mm -hmm. you know, this is great. You know, you want this next book. You want this. It's like, we're never in the middle. <laughs> well, well, that's a th the funny thing is I'm, I have this very big love hate relationship with my books where I'll get really passionate for it and I'll write it. For example, okay, right now I'm working on a new book for Severed Press. It's called Mega Flora. And basically it's um, Jurassic Park mixed with Little Shop of Horrors set in the Australian outbook, Outback. Oh man! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Feed me giant, Seymour. <laughs> yeah, it's a giant killer plant story in the Australian outback. Um, you know, and I, I, I outlined it because I'm, I have to outline my books, and it's very you know one line per chapter kind of outline. Yeah. Um, and I wrote wrote it, sixty nine thousand words went great, printed it off, started doing the um you know the line the editing, and I and, and I and it hit me, and. It's that sort of thing. I have, you know, like you, you, uh, bleh. everyone talks about the rules, you know, like um, Robert Highland had his rules for writing, Ray Bradbury, Bar you know, you guys have covered all those guys. Yeah. I've got one, I've got one rule and it's more of like, it's a commandment. Thou shall not tell a boring story. 
Sounds like a good one to me. Yeah, every, everything else doesn't matter. That's the one. If you tell a boring story, you failed. And I'm reading this, you know, 69,000 word thing that took me about a couple of months to write. And it sucked. It was the most boring thing ever. Oh. Like, seriously, I'm reading it and I'm going, this is this is worse than Twilight. This is worse than, oh. you know, Fifty Shades. This is so boring. And, and I'm not talking about the characters. I'm talking about the action. Everything is boring. And I'm just sitting there like, I've, I've truly and utterly screwed up. I've, you know, Mia Culpa, I've failed. <laughs> now, granted, okay, there, it, th this comes back to um, Mexico. Living in Mexico, I was writing a lot. Everything was great. At the end of 2018, I had to quit my, um, my first teaching job. And for a period of three months, I didn't work. And that began, that kind of affected my marriage. And... By the end of 2019, I was suicidally depressed, not writing. Marriage failed. All right. 2020, left my ex-wife, and COVID hit. <laughs> right, yeah, pile on. Uh, at the same time, I owed Severed Press the value of Beecho. So I, I didn't do any writing until about October, where I did, uh, September, I did two short stories to see what I could do. Then I did NaNoWriMo. And I'm doing the second version of Valia Bicho, and I had the idea for Mega Flora. And this is my problem. I get the idea for it. it I'll pitch it to Seven. They'll say yes. I'm like, I sold a book. Oh, shit, I need to write the book. <laughs> yeah. You still have to deliver it, yeah. H happy problem. <laughs> then in t early this year, it was, okay, make, you know, my divorce became finalized, and it was, okay, I can, you know, start making preparations to come back to Australia. And I was trying to outline Mega Flora at the time. And when I was in the hotel quarantine for the two weeks, I was trying to outline and then getting readjusted to living in a house. You know, I was living alone for all of last year. So I'm living in, I'm living with my parents at the moment. Mm -hmm. And my sister had a baby. So babies over here quite a bit as that sort of thing of, okay, getting used to writing with all these people. And I forced the outline to happen and all that. So is that a case of, okay, no wonder it sucked. I wasn't right. I've almost finished the second version. <laughs> that's you know it will be 60 i basically cut out nine thousand words that sped everything up so um it's going great but i have for me my writing it's either i i've never said this is awesome i've never had that thing of this is fucking awesome you buy it for me it's a case of i wrote this book yeah. every time it's i i wrote this and you know I, I, okay i told you the idea that what you know the elevator pitch for mega floor you went, oh that sounds cool and i'm there thinking really to me that sounds so silly <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, if you're into interesting stories, like you said, you know, you, you think about that and it's like, that sounds really interesting. So it's exciting, you know, it's something and it's, it's a different take on stuff. So, well, yeah, um, I, I feel the same way. Like uh, when I write stuff, I like it. I love it when I'm outlining and when I come mm -hmm. up with the idea, I like it when I'm writing it. As soon as I'm done, I hate it. Uh -huh. And I think it's crap. And and uh, honestly, you know, I used to do a lot of rewriting and editing and stuff. And I've just gotten to the point where I know myself and it's just going to be, you know, water torture. I can't do it. So I do the best that I can. And then I let the editor take over. And then that's it. It's like, I'm not going to labor over this because um, because I used to go crazy over every word and. And even when you hit the publish button, you still don't think it's ready. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. so what's the difference? Why waste this time and make myself mental over this? Do the best I can and then let the little birdie fly and yep. and then get on to the new thing. Well, see, funny enough, I've never had that. I've I've never had that problem of, um, you know, worrying about is it's perfect for me. It's a case of get it done. I'll do the edit. And because I do, I'm doing a lot. I, I, I've only self-published two things. Everything else is out with a publisher. You know, it's that sort of thing of, all right, I'll do my editing pass. I'll throw it to them and I'll start the next project. For me, mm -hmm. it's a case of once it's done, it's done. It's only right. going to be, it's, it, you know, perfection will never exist because, you know, it doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> See, I, I write. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're good with written words. Spoken, yeah. it's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to speak, uh, my my dad makes fun of me because I do this all the time, and he says, "Oh, yes, you're a wordsmith," and I go, "No," 
when it comes to writing, that's where it's important. When it's speaking, who gives a shit? <laughs> well, listen to the Mondo method. You hear Armand and I all the time with our, you know, the slip of the tongue. Because yes. now that we're old, you know, you're like, you just can't find that word. And you're like in the middle of sentence, you're like, uh, 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 I don't know. I can't think of the word now. And then you're like, how can I be a writer? I can't even think of the damn word. Like, this is so embarrassing. And then, of course, as soon as we're done recording, I remember the word. I'm like, oh, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But we're all like that. That's that's just a common problem for writers. It's not just well, you. <laughs> thank you for letting me down easy. I appreciate that. Oh, no. We're all retarded. Um <laughs> Oh, yes, we're politically incorrect on this show. Um, but and so for me, it's OK, it's going to, you know, OK, when it's finished, I go, right, I'll do it. You know, my editing is I'll run it through Pro Writing Aid, then I'll mm -hmm. print it off, go through there, you know, I'll, and then it's OK, glaring plot holes. But I find it funny. You know, a lot of authors are like, oh, you know, they, they have to kill that internal editor when they're writing because they want everything to be perfect. Right. I've never had that problem. For me, the internal editor, he's passed out in the back there. <laughs> yeah. Because I spend forever on an outline. That's the hardest part for me is outlining because I'm figuring out all the structural problems then and there instead of going blah, blah, blah. Okay, writing it and then going, oh, man, this is, ooh, okay, okay, fix the holes. <laughs> yeah, that that's my fear, and that's why I, I – you know, I use outlines too. And, and like you, you know, I used to be, I had a paragraph for every chapter and now I'm down to about a sentence or two, yeah. um, you know, really just the meat and potatoes, just so that I know what I want to say in that chapter. Um, because for me, I got to know where I'm going and how I'm getting there because otherwise like how I speak, I'll just go off on tangents uh -huh. and I'll never get there or I'll end up in a different place, which may not be a bad thing. You know, if you're a pantser and if you're good at it, uh -huh. that could be a good thing, you know, but for me, I, I've just, it has not worked well for me. So I need some kind of outline um, at least as a basis. And then you yeah. can riff off of that, uh -huh. you know, and, exactly. and let the characters, enlighten you about what should happen but you still know you still know what needs to happen and where to go yes exactly um i mean i, I love the conversation of you know pantsing and plotting i love it because um an author friend of mine was saying that you know they were on a um, panel with some other relatively big authors and, and this was this came up in the discussion and one of them just basically said if you're a pantser you will never write a good book and that was, you know, that was his grand plot <laughs> and, and, and and this author friend of mine, she's, you know, she is a, you know, she's got 20 books out. All of them are pants. And she's like. Yeah, the gauntlet has been thrown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find it funny that, that there are certain things that in, in it's, and it's in, I don't know if it's in the, um, you know, the big boy um, community, but in the indie community, there are certain things that. I find hilarious being you have to do it like this. You have to do it like that. And I sit there and I, and I think, well, that's how you create problems. That's how you create imposter syndrome. <laughs> well, and, and nothing great. If you think about any invention or creation throughout human history, um, the only time that there was progress or something great came out, it was somebody taking an absolute risk. Some, somebody, pushing the boundaries doing something outside the lines yeah so so i agree to say that you know this is the way it's done and that's it all right maybe it works for you maybe that's your paradigm but to say that that applies to everybody it's just not true i mean people people are great writers who who pants and then there's also great writers who outline so yeah um you know, choosing one over the other, it, it's a personal choice. It's not a manifesto or, or an absolute. That's it. And as we all know, only the Siths deal in absolutes. Um, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, it's a good day when you get to bust out a Star Wars quote. <laughs> I, I was actually impressed by that. And my son will be even more so when he listens to this because he's he's huge in the Star Wars stuff. So he'll oh. be like, oh, my God, you know, that's great. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a diehard 
you know, I'm a nerd. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I grew up watching, like, you know, as a kid, it was Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Star Trek, all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to be raised. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know nothing else. That's the thing. I, I Don't ask me about politics, geography, barely know any history. But when it comes to pop culture, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to know any of that other stuff. The history books are really, you know, A New Hope and everything else. Indiana <laughs> Jones, like anything that came from that era. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, my, my, my education of science was from Looney Tunes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know the speed. You know the speed of light. Okay. How fast does Wiley e. Coyote need to go before he slams into the wall? Well. <laughs> yeah. And and are there really such a thing as anvils? You know, it's funny because you don't even see those types of cartoons anymore. And like we were raised on that. So, well, I don't know how old you are. I think you're much younger than me. But anyway, you obviously have seen the cartoons. But um. But yeah, like you can't even find those cartoons now because you know they're they're I guess not politically correct and everything else, mm. but. Really, it, you think about like all the stuff you learned growing up watching those things, you know, um, that gravity doesn't really work, you know, yes. that, you know, um, and and just you think about all the, the classical music pieces that they worked into those cartoons yes. and stuff and and worked it in with um, with like the character. You know, I, I'm just thinking of like the Bugs Bunny cartoon where. Um, they're massaging the, the shampoo or the head thing into the guy. And it's like, the rabbit of Seville. Yes. Yes. The rabbit, <laughs> thank you. I, I couldn't think of the name of see another uh, old man. So. <laughs> and, um, you know, the exposure to classical music, you don't get that now on powder puff girls or anything. No. Not that there's anything wrong with those cartoons. I love them when my kids were growing up, but um, I'm just saying like, you know, it's uh, maybe they were fallible because of the time that they were made, but they also exposed us to a lot of cool stuff, you know, like the classical music. So, oh, yeah. Whatever. Well, see, it, funny, it's funny that you brought up the Rabbit of Seville. I was actually watching that one the other day. <laughs> really? <laughs> it, 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 if I want to watch a, a Bugs Bunny cartoon, it's, that's usually my go to Bugs Bunny cartoon. Oh man! Yeah, now now I have such a nostalgic moment. I I really got to go see if I can find them on YouTube or something. So oh, I can you'll you, you'll be able yeah you'll find them you'll be able to find them on YouTube. I mean, you know I've got I'm looking up up just the room I'm in. I'm looking up. There's you know some um old now this shows you how old I am. Some old CD and DVD um you know cases you know. Mm-hmm. Where you know you've got the um the sleeve and you slide slide in and you know zipper and all that <laughs> for the young kids watching um <laughs> and you know I've got one there's one up here labeled just Looney Tunes and it's this thick <laughs> oh man yeah I mean that was great you would wake up and watch that in the morning while you were eating breakfast getting ready uh-huh. for school then you come home from school and you would avoid homework watching those yeah. and then of course Saturday after uh, Saturday morning forget it. You wake up, you know, you spill your your cereal all over your lap, and you just sit there in your pajamas and watch Looney Tunes cartoons from the second you wake up until like five o'clock. <laughs> oh yeah, that was it. I mean, it was great here here when I was growing up. You could, it was afternoons, Monday to Friday afternoons, and it was basically an hour of just Looney Tunes. Yeah. And then Saturday morning, it was the animated Batman show from the nineties. Oh, so, okay. You know, my the the, edu- the education I got, yeah, it just rolls. You know, it's just one of those things. I sit there and go, I was so lucky to grow up at that point. <laughs> also with Mark Hamill, right? Didn't he do the voice yes, of the Joker, the Joker in those? I, I, I'll, I'll, or Star it, Wars. See? Yep, it, it's funny. <laughs> you know, people talk about, oh, where, you know, where were you when this big moment happened? And I, I always remember when my dad told me that Luke Skywalker was the voice of the Joker. You know, when he busted that part out, my little brain just went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, how could that be? How could that be? And then, of course, you're always listening for, like, the nuance in the voice that that really tells you that it's him. Yes. Because, you know, he did a great job of masking it. And you're just like, oh, let me listen. Just like I never knew that Casey Kasem was um, was the voice of uh, – didn't he do uh, Shaggy on uh... – Yes. <laughs> You know, so yes. I grew up listening to him on the radio, you know, on his top 40 or whatever, his his – pop show on the radio and uh, in america and then i think he was the voice of shaggy on scooby-doo which you watch every day and then once you found that out you're like what and then you're always listening to like no it doesn't sound like him it can't be him you know it's yeah. just like yep well, blows it. your mind I, well see i never believed i never believed my dad that it was mark hamill as the yeah. joker and then you know 
YouTube comes along and there it is. There's a clip of him doing it. I'm just sitting there going, son of a bitch. <laughs> and all lies. Like Santa Claus. Everything has been a lie my whole life. Wait, wait, wait. What's that about Santa Claus? No, no, I, I, I was talking about something else, actually. <laughs> I believe. I believe in Bigfoot and UFOs, too. So, you know. Well, you're, obviously, you also believe in Australia. Um, <laughs> I do. So let's get back to your accent. So I know you got mad at me. Now you didn't get mad at me. But, but you thought it was funny when I tried to, when I uh, did a horrendous Australian accent on the Mondo method. So now, yes. so it, now to me, I'm trying to picture you teaching English in Mexico. Now, did, did they learn English with an Australian accent or? Well, it's funny. I, I don't have a full blown proper Aussie accent. Um, yeah, I can actually understand you. Yeah, and part of and part of that is because <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> That's a actually that was the first on the show. First time I've ever flipped someone off on the show. Um, you're special. <laughs> I feel so blessed. <laughs> you should, sir. Um, <laughs> when I was when I first started teaching in Mexico, I actually asked them, look. Do you want me to teach them Australian pronunciation or American pronunciation because they deal with the U.S. more? And my teacher said, you just teach them your English. Mm -hmm. Now, as a kid, I had speech problems. So when I told my parents I was teaching English, you know, both of them were like, oh, those poor Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And I normally I talk very, very, very fast. So I had to slow myself down. Um, and my accent has changed because of that. Um, you know, everyone here in Australia, they're kind of like, oh, you know, how, so how long have you been living in Australia? I was born here. Really? You don't, you sound more American. <sighs> well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just that sort of thing. And when I, they would say to me, oh, go, you know, Richard in, in Mexico, go for Australian and be like, g'day mate. How's it going, Cobber? <laughs> Yeah. Like how it comes on the Barbie, you know, that sort of thing, you know, the full Steve Irwin. <laughs> yeah, well, see, and growing up, so we had, we had, um, everything was Crocodile Dundee, but even before uh, that, you know, it was Mad Max. Yes. You know, so, and, was it, and his accent, you know, Mel Gibson's wasn't exceptionally difficult to understand. You know, I had a harder time, I think, understanding British accents. Uh-huh. Growing up watching like the Benny Hill and Monty Python and stuff, you would only get like half of the jokes because the other half you're just like, what did they say? You know, like yep. I, I didn't understand because your ears just not tuned to it. Um, and Mad Max, you know, there were Australian accents, but it was it was mellowed like it, it wasn't as harsh. So it was easier to understand. Yep. Um, and then Crocodile Dundee, of course, was just like, you know, over the top because it's about a guy from Australia, you know? Yeah. Oh, and not only from Australia, from the outback, you know, so right. it is that. And then, you know, we had, you know, Steve Irwin comes on the scene and everyone kind of has that image, you know, across the world. An Australian is Steve Irwin and, you know, Crocodile Dundee put together. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, OK, I, I pulled you up for your accent, but it wasn't the worst I've ever heard. No, uh, but, so I'm going to have to work on it because I, I want to really earn you know the, the bird so <laughs> the f funny enough the worst accent i ever heard was from a mexican who who was just learning english and they decided they were going to do a mexican an australian accent oh really <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and, and it was the first class of this poor guy and he you know he was so proud of himself because he he'd watched mad max he watched you know steve Irwin, and, and you know he, he he wanted to say you know like the whole you know ah oh, good day mate and with this ultra ultra thick Mexican accent, it sounded more like a Indian person trying to sound like they're from, you know, Texas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's probably what I sound like to my in-laws because I, I married a Cuban woman, and um, ah. you know, so I I pretend. Not only do I pretend on TV and and on podcast to speak Australian accents, um, I also do Cuban accents. So you know. Um, with just as much failure, so it's okay. Uh, come on, let's hear it. No, I, I, it's come on. <laughs> no, I, you know, I you know it, it's funny. Um, and I grew up 
taking Spanish classes in high school and I got straight A's. Like I was very good at it. Like the teacher was always like, oh, you pronounce, you know, you roll your, R, your R's, you pronounce stuff um, properly as opposed to the other kids in the class who were, you know, kind of goofing off or weren't serious about it. Um, but I didn't know anybody who spoke Spanish. You know, I was like that much in like white America that I didn't know like any Spanish speaking people. So I lost the skill. Um, then I went off to to college, you know, much bigger mm -hmm. uh, at the university. There, there's all kinds of people of different walks. And um, and it just so happened that I I kind of have a thing, I guess, for Spanish speaking women. That's like my thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very attracted to them. And um, so I dated a lot of Spanish speaking uh, women and but again my what I learned in speaking it was gone and I, and the girls didn't last long enough keeping me around for me to pick it up again like they pretty much found out quickly like what a turd I was and and they would dump <laughs> me uh, somehow I, I I tricked my wife though and uh, you know got got in with her and it's funny so I still can't speak it but uh, my ear finally got attuned to it so when they speak I at least know the general gist of what's going on. I know exactly when they're talking about me, um, you know, but I, I can't speak it. And they'll ask me a question in Spanish and, I, and I'll be able to like answer in English, you know, yeah. like I understand enough. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at every I can't even command the English language. So what makes anybody <laughs> think I could do Spanish or Australian or anything else? You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, it, it, it's, it, see, I get that because, you know, I lived in Mexico for five years and my Spanish went from being nothing to being almost something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when everyone said use it or lose know, it, right? It, well, yeah, but growing up in Australia, okay. In the schools I went to here in Australia, this is, these are the languages I, I learned German, Italian, Japanese, not once did Spanish ever come up because it's not part of the culture. There's no population here. It's that not that sort of thing. So, I, I, I've always thought it's bloody hilarious that I ended up moving to a country where I knew nothing of the language. <laughs> yeah. And by the time I was done and, you know, when I left my um, ex-wife and I was living alone, my Spanish greatly improved. And all my friends said it, said it to me. They said, oh, you know, when you talk Spanish, Richard, you sound like a retarded three-year-old. <laughs> but you're, co you're coherent. <laughs> so you couldn't – you didn't have – you didn't have her to rely on as much, I guess. So you were forced to command yeah. it. <laughs> and I mean, I had to, I had to get in an apartment. Now that was all done, you know, all done in Spanish. I had to organize internet. I had to organize all this stuff and it was all done in Spanish. So yeah, wow. I had to, you know, it was, as you said, you know, use it or lose it. And it was just funny when they said, oh yeah, you sound like a retarded three-year-old, but you are coherent. And I'd said to them, well, what do you mean? They said, oh, you don't conjugate anything. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We know what you're saying. It's just that you're not conjugating it. You're not using the right verb tense. You know, in Spanish, they've got like you know, 25 million different verb tenses, um, and all this sort of stuff. And I said, okay. And they said, also, you you don't bother with the masculine and the feminine. You know, and that was the thing that gave me the shits. Was okay. You know, in Mex in Spanish, you know, a door. A door has a gender. Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and. And you're right, like the verb conjugation is is tricky. Well, at least to people who are, you know, English speaking, because it almost feels like the verb comes first, uh -huh. you know, so it like tricks you. Whereas in English, everything is like subject, predicate, you know, whatever. And for me, the Spanish is the opposite. You know, it's almost like you're giving the action and then what's acting yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's just the way I interpret it. No, but no I have problems with that. No, yeah, it's almost like you're doing the passive voice all the time in Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could yeah. see that. Yeah, which is why I hate it because I hate the passive voice. <laughs> oh well, then don't read any of my books because uh, actually, I, I actually uh, I had another author who's you know I, I consider to be a big author who um, who you know reached out to me and, and was like, hey, you know. Your stuff's not bad, but you have a lot of passive voice, you know, and and not that they ripped me a new one, but they kind of, you know, it, it was like, oh, I didn't like ask for any of this advice, but I appreciate it, you know. Um, but, but it was just like one of those things, you know, and now like I'm overly conscious of it and I'm sure I still have passive voice here and there. Um, OK, here's the thing. And 
this is something I I I I, I used to be staunchly staunchly you know anti passive voice, but sometimes you've got to use it. There's just sometimes where if you word it in the active voice, it's not going to make sense. It will make sense passively. Hmm. You know, if if you're doing say the passive, if you're using the passive voice, say, you know, five times in a paragraph, that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, well, and sometimes, you know what, I think you're right, though, because sometimes when you're trying to be active with, like, the verbs and stuff, it feels too forced or uh-huh. almost, like, not forced, but canned, maybe. Like, like that's what's expected or what it's supposed uh-huh. to be. It's not but natural. it doesn't feel, that's it. That's what I, that's what I was just thinking. I was like, but it doesn't feel natural. And so then sometimes, see, now I'll, I'll see it and I'll try and change it. And in the past, I just went with it because it was more natural. Mm-hmm. And, that's, um, and that's because when we speak, we use, when we talk, we're using passive voice more than action, active voice when we're talking naturally. So if you write the way you talk, it is going to be more have more passive. And yeah, I understand people saying don't use it because I used to do it all the time. But now I have uh, for me, it's like okay, if I you know if if I go through a page and there's maybe over an entire page, there's maybe two or three moments of passive voice that's good Mm -hmm. if there's five in one paragraph i need to rework it (laughs) right yeah and that i could agree with i I mean i think there's certain points where it it necessitates it but i agree if it's overused then you're not doing it right yeah and i mean like you said about your work okay you know i've you know i've listened to the you know the first two books in the gushes and i really enjoy those i've got the son of earth stuff on my kindle to read Uh (laughs) uh-oh (laughs) <laughs> well you keep you keep you kept talking about it on Mondo on the Mondo method and I was like okay I'm gonna have to check this out he keeps bringing it up either it's really bad or it's really good either way I've got to read it <laughs> you know it it's funny because that series sells um it's it, I mean who would have thunk it right because it's um horror is a small genre it's a niche and then then you take horror mixed with western is even smaller so it's like okay let's find the absolute only three people on the planet that (laughs) read this stuff that's what i'm gonna write and that's kind of what i did and i did it just because of my dad um you know because i grew up watching westerns Mm -hmm. with him you know again going back to the serials watching gunsmoke and uh the rifleman and all that kind of stuff and uh bonanza and and uh you know, I, I, I've always wanted to, to write and and even when I published like my first stuff, you know, um, my father was just like, he's like, oh, it's it's good. He's like, you know, but it's hard, you know, and, and so I guess on some level, I was always still trying to, even as a man, impress my father and win his approval, you know, so it was like, OK, how do I do that? Well. I'll marry my love of horror and his love of Westerns and I'll write supernatural Westerns. <laughs> and, um, and it worked because he actually read them and, you know, he, he was funny. He gave me feedback. Cause I think in the first book um, I had the guy wearing chaps in a bar and he's like, nobody would wear chaps in a bar. He's like, they wear that, you know, when they ride horses mm. and stuff. And I should know that because I used to watch all the movies and the shows with them. Um, you know, but that was like one of those little nuances that, I just didn't even think about and uh and he pointed out but you know he so he read the western stuff and he's he's like yeah it's not bad you know and all this kind of stuff and and that's really why i got into it but i i do love that stuff too because i have the love of the both the horror yeah. and the western so um so for me it was just a natural fit but again it's like you know talk about fine not chasing you know what's hot is uh yeah, and, and that could be debated now because then all the splatterpunk stuff has come out uh-huh. and, and has done very well and and um and rightfully so because those are amazing authors um and my stuff's not splatter you know i never uh i never meant for my son of herb series to be extreme horror it's yeah. just supernatural um but yeah so it's uh i think i like that series the most out of all the ones i've written and and it sells the best and i guess it it still surprises me because I would think that the the gushers with the sex and the violence or, you know, more of the crime thriller stuff mm. of like the deck collector would be more popular. But um, but it's not. So, you know, it just goes to show you you think you have the answers and who knows. OK. You've set up expectations now for it. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I think you'll like it. Um, you know, I get I get good feedback and good reviews on it. It's um, but it's just a small niche. You know, there's just yeah. so many people who are interested in that. So, oh yeah, well, and I get that. I mean, um, you know, like I put out Kaiju World. Okay, that was with Severed, but that's aimed at the Kaiju fans, and that's a small and rabid fan base. Who, if you you know you you go off the beaten path, they're going to tell you a new one faster than you will ever expect. Well, it's um, like the zombie. Uh, yeah, same thing. I mean, they are religious about how zombies behave and act and stuff. And, you know, yes, some zombie readers read other horror, but it's not it's not a one to one correlation at all. Just yeah. like you said with the Kaiju, like they're in it for the zombies. Yeah. Just like the Kaiju people are in it for the Kaiju. Don't give me the other stuff. Just give me what I want. <laughs> well, that's a, like that's the thing. I, I I've got a book coming out next year from D&T Publishing and it's called Zombie Nazis on a Train. See if you can figure awesome. out what, what it's about. Yeah, <laughs> everyone loves the title, and that one it's a okay. Naturally, it's a zombie story, and yes, it's got Nazis, and yes, it's on a train, but the zombies aren't your typical zombies. That's the thing, and it's going to be one of those things where I'm I'm curious to okay, find me things like hey, people who read this and get it are going to love it, and people who read it and don't like and and are like well no zombies won't act like this. Zombies don't do this, and they're going to come for me. <laughs> Yeah, like we, and you know what? There, it's there's there's nothing wrong with being polarizing because, um, because anyway, the 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 art is in the eye of the beholder, right? So yeah. y- you can't please everybody. But the other thing is is, um, it going back to the the creative side of it, you know, pushing the boundaries. That that's what we do. You know, we try different things. Sometimes yeah. it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we're gonna we're gonna try like hell to push. <laughs> Oh, oh, 100 percent. Um, <laughs> so, OK, um, I, I usually ask this question. OK, OK. So you're at a convention. OK, you're the guest of honor at a convention. You know, congratulations, Chuck. <laughs> oh, yes. And this guy comes up to you and he says, you know, Chuck, I've read all your stuff. I've listened to the Mando method. You've inspired me. I want to become an author. What's your one piece of advice? I say, go get an accounting degree. (laughs) No. um, (laughs) uh, You know what? That's, I don't know. You stumped me on that. It's uh, (laughs) a, I I would definitely say go for it. Um, uh, You know, but, but go for it um, with your head screwed on right or with your eyes wide open. So, you know, don't quit your day job um and try to learn as much as you can you know i'm a big fan for continuous improvement so um read read other people's stuff read the books on writing listen to lots of podcasts about writing um find what you like find what you don't like and you know and and make it a process i think too often too often especially now with the internet and everything else you know it's about there's no delayed gratification. So it's like, I, I just want to write a book right now and make a million dollars and have it turned into a Netflix movie uh-huh. and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and you and I know that that's not going to happen, but we still dream about it, you know, <laughs> and we still think about it and pray for it. Um, but the reality is, is that that's not going to happen. So, you know, do what you love. So if you really want to do that and you love it, go for it, you know, and I'm here to help. There's plenty of us who are here to help. I mean, Armand helped me. You know, he had Jay Conrath and Scott Nicholson help him. Um, everybody's got some kind of tutor or mentor or somebody yeah. who helped them along the way. And, um, you know, so find that person for yourself and go for it and and try your best. But, um, you know, know going in that it's it's an uphill battle, you know, or struggle, I should say. It's not a battle, but it's a struggle more more with yourself than against publishing or anything else because um finishing a novel or even a novella that's hard you know i spent 30 years writing in the closet you know i always say for myself and uh, i couldn't finish anything you know and everything was a shorter piece of work just because it's so hard to stick with something for you don't realize like how many thousands of words it takes until you actually become a writer and you finish like a longer work and you're like 
you know, anybody can do it. Yes, anybody can write a story or a novel. But just getting from the first word to the last word is a lot more than people think, <laughs> you know, because it's a lot of stick to itiveness, you know, um, it, it's it's a journey and, and not a not a sprint or it's not a you know marathon and whatever all the phrases are. But um, but yeah, that, that's a good one. I, I would say go for it, but learn as much as you can, ask questions and listen to people who know better. Don't be Chuck. I always say don't be Chuck. Don't listen to Armand's advice and then still do your own thing and fail. Like actually <laughs> listen to the guy and follow what he says because <laughs> he's right. He's right for a reason because he did it already. <laughs> the voice of experience. <laughs> yeah. And, well, he also told me that I better say that or he was going to punch me in the face next time he saw me. So. <laughs> but that can't happen. The restraining order should still be in place, right? <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're safe there. <laughs> <laughs> and for the, for the millions of people who are watching this, and it will be millions because, you know, you are Chuck Buddha, where can everyone find you? <laughs> um, well, obviously not too often on social media. Uh, <laughs> If I am on social media, I'm on Twitter uh, at C.E. Buddha, uh, B-U-D-A. But um, I have an author website. It's uh, in the process of being revamped because I was hacked by Russian porn. Uh, so my old website was taken <laughs> I remember, over. <laughs> I, I remember that story. <laughs> yeah, so it used to be ChuckBuddha.com, but now it's AuthorChuckBuddha.com because of uh, the Russian mafia porn <laughs> thing um but yeah on amazon and and i'm also on barnes and noble and all those other places kobo now because i i am wide too so um people could just google me i think there's like 20 pages of me there most of them are pictures of me drunk at beers and beers <laughs> events so don't laugh too hard <laughs> <laughs> and of course like you said listen to the mondo method podcast for armand's advice and to enjoy all the pitfalls that i go through uh, but see those pitfalls it's a learning experience and there are certain moments where you've done something and, and i've gone oh i was about to try that right now i won't <laughs> so you know thank you for your service <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll i'll try to keep doing that for you and i'll try to keep in mind also uh trying new things um which i need to get back to doing so that you know hopefully i can help educate more people and uh and maybe sell some books myself there you go i'll put links to everything in the description chuck Thank you so much for coming on today. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. I love you. <laughs> and once again, a very big thank you to Chuck for coming on today. You can find links to his work in the description below. And if you would like to see any particular authors come on the show, please feel free to put their names in the description below or reach out to me directly. I'm RF, RF Blackstone. This is Behind the Keyboards. And as always, boils and ghouls, stay spooky.